Welcome everyone to today's Assimilate webinar for Scratch 6 and Scratch Lab. This webinar is brought to you by both Assimilate and FX Guide, and my name is Aggie Frizzell. As you can see, our topic today is tips and tricks for a web scratch workflow from onset through post-production. Now let's take a quick look at our agenda for today. Our presenter will use approximately 40 minutes to discuss the workflow. We'll then have 10 minutes for a live Q&A before we wrap up. And for future access, this webinar will be posted to Assimilate's website within 24 hours. You will also find other webinars listed on the website that may be useful to you at www.assimilateinc.com. Now I would like to introduce today's presenter, Mike Seymour. Many of you know Mike Seymour, the co-founder of FX Guide, acclaimed visual effects ace, and early adopter of the RED cameras. Mike will discuss shooting with RED on set and how to use Scratch to produce great results, including the dailies workflow, color space, managing unlimited versions of shots, remote review via HTML, adding custom comments via sticky notes, and metadata management. And now I'd like to turn the conversation over to Mike Seymour. Hi, I'm Mike Seymour, and welcome to this kind of informal uh, webinar chat about Scratch and Scratch Lab. Um, let me explain. My background is from post-production. I really came uh, at everything from, well, first and foremost being, I guess, a flame operator. Way before that, I was a filmmaker. Um, and increasingly, I find myself back on set. And I started using Scratch years ago, and I was using it on a uh, feature film, which actually went on to win a bunch of awards, which was great. We've used it consistently since then, especially once Scratch became synonymous with Red, because uh, literally I started with it before it even before the RED camera company even existed. Um, the reason that we use it is it's a really great station for us for being um, a staging platform for feeding into VFX. It's also a great staging platform for stuff on set. So that's what I want to discuss Scratch about this week. I want to look at it from the point of view of using it on set, which is now much easier with the new lab product, which is a sort of reduced functionality, cheaper version. Um, and also for use in a VFX facility or somewhere where you're setting up shots for the pipeline and perhaps looping shots back and seeing it in the cut and stuff. Uh, so I'm going to look at both of those things on, on the machine in one second. But as I say, there are lots of different ways you can look at uh, Scratch. I've obviously used it for a whole lot of things, but it is particularly good when uh, using it with red footage. And as we've had one of the first, uh, well, I think we had camera number 22, red one, and we had one of the first epics that was released. We've been working really closely uh, with red and also assimilate over the years uh, on this stuff. So I love it. I like using it. I find it really good. And also find, as you'll see in a second, it plays well with others, which is really a big difference uh, between, I guess, you know, just looking at something in isolation and saying, oh, isn't that cool, and actually dealing with it as I like to in a workflow. So let's look at Scratch now, both the lab product on set uh, and in the facility environment as a workflow tool, something that you can afford to apply to a whole lot of different situations over a long period of time in a robust, works well with others kind of environment. Okay, so I've got a bunch of constructs and groups in here, which I will be dealing with in a sec, but basically, uh, for those of you that really are not super familiar with Scratch, I have a timeline across here, uh, which is a timeline in a, in a non-traditional timeline sense, not in a Final Cut or Avid sense, because these don't change widths, um, but it's a great concept in the, the sense that these are the shots following one after another, and this construct is... Uh, with the addition of the staging, which is sort of an additional uh, thing since I first started using uh, Scratch, is a great way for setting up to do stuff. What I'm going to do, though, is um, show you a couple of things. First, gonna, as I said before, just quickly touch on um, the lab and then quickly touch on some stuff to do with Red and, and HDRX. One of the reasons I like uh, Scratch on set is there are a lot of things that you need to do to kind of make it really um, powerful for doing the sort of things that are required to be done by someone on set. Um, and I'll give you a classic example. It's actually from the end of the process. Let's say I'd imported a whole lot of shots here and sort of stacked them together as the kind of hero takes that the director had liked that day. In this case, this is from a short film that we did uh, called Moving Day. Um, so let's say I'd done that. Um, sort of things that you need to be thinking about beyond colour grading, beyond sort of editing um, that Scratch provides in the case of Scratch Lab would be, for example, an HTML export. So here I would, you know, obviously brought in a bunch of shots and I, let's say I've gone through that process and selected. I can't give you 
all the steps today, but just let's say those are the clips that I want and the director likes them, then I can just go here to um, commands and hit export. Now I've got the group selected as you can see and instead of um, outputting this as you might want to do, um, what I'm going to do is select it here as a uh, HTML group. Now when I hit that and send it out, if I just on my, I'm running this on a, on a Mac, by the way, which is a huge thing for me to be running on a Mac. And I just go up to the desktop, and in the desktop here is uh, that group that I just exported, and you can see those are the clips just immediately in an HTML, which I can then obviously post up on a private uh, website or intranet or whatever you wanted, so that the director would have um, access to the clip numbers or the shots. So I can just send it to anybody else for that matter. And it's those kind of services that make Lab a really, really useful product for when you're uh, doing stuff. It's just like a ton of that kind of stuff. That's the stuff that shows the product's been around for a while, and it's not, you know, just a, um, a new product. Even though Lab itself, of course, is a relatively new product, um, just having that kind of functionality uh, is some of the stuff that makes it really, really good. So what I want to discuss is um, stuff to do with uh, maybe setting up a um, new, let me just close that up, a new uh, setup and something that I might be doing that's different from uh, other things. So what I'm going to do right now is just going to add a new construct. I'm just going to give it a name. Uh, okay, so, and I'm just going to add some stuff. In this case, I'd be adding some uh, material that would be, um, uh, I don't know, some uh, stuff that I've shot for uh, classes over at FX PhD, the new term. So this is shot on the Epic. And I want to you know, look at these clips. There's uh, a bunch of clips here. Let's say I wanted to bring all of those in, for example. Um, then what it's going to do is it's going to load all those clips in. This is, again, as I say, the sort of thing you might want to do. Now, obviously, these aren't trimmed. So you can see here these are very much, um, you know, as you say, camera stop to camera stop. Uh, but in addition to just the obvious stuff, like having camera stop to camera stop, you'll see that if I just uh, play this for a second, you'll see that some of these clips um, look com immediately wrong. So I'm just going to show you what I would, I would do. The reason they look wrong, even though this is astonishingly fast, is it's windowing in at the moment to that at basically full resolution. So I'm going to want to change the shot configuration on these to um, actually have them scale. I would normally do fit with, but you can see that because of the aspect ratio between the red that I shot this on and what we're looking at today, there's this sort of black um, kind of uh, top and bottom. You can just see that if I bring it down. See that sort of black line top and bottom? So if I actually scale, uh, what I'll do is do it for all of them, scale by height, and then I'll just give it to me in the exact 16 by 9 ratio. Okay, so now I've got these at the right height, and you'll note that some of them look different to the others because we've deliberately gone and shot some of these and put them in um, red log. Now, this is really important because what we have here is a product in the lab that is also a, f a good player with others. Because one of the things about Scratch that I've always thought is that it's designed to fit into the other things you have in a facility. So in this case, the difference between these two clips, why this one looks kind of washed out and this one isn't, is one of the things I want to discuss today, which is the idea of color spaces. And in fact, this clip, uh, the one that we're actually looking at right now, this clip is not coming in as uh, a normal file that's been changed to a red log file. Now it's changed to that in uh, Red Cine. And the reason that I point this out is that if you do change something over in Red Cine or you do something, Scratch is going to respect the what's called the RMD or the, the file that's created by Red Cine X. And so if that was changed for whatever reason to be not Red Gamma, uh, and you're accessing these files, it's going to completely respect that. Now I can reset here to the RMD, which is that file that was created when it was maybe looked at by another app, such as Red Cine X, or what was shot, of course, on set, which is, uh, in this case, Red Gamma 2. And so those two buttons there reflect this, I think, important point, which is that I say Scratch is a good player with others uh, in a facility or, or on set. So, okay, so now I've got my clips. And, and this just brings up the first big point that I would, did want to kind of touch on, which is this idea of what's going on with um, color space and the sort of things you have to worry about, uh, especially if you're working uh, with the lab product in an onset environment as we are here. Now, there are two really important aspects to red footage full stop. It's got nothing to do with, um, I guess, uh, what's happening other than the interpretation of it by Assimilate, which is that if we just look at color, we have the color space that we're going into, which could be a video color space. And you'll notice a slight uh, saturation in particular change here. 
uh, between that and the red colour too, which is, I guess, the latest colour science from red. So that's the colour uh, palette, if you like, the gamut of colours that are available. And that's a really important step because red shoots raw. This is the first step in, in a process, the second of which is to then go into uh, and have some gamma. So let's look at this without any gamma and uh, just to illustrate what's going on. So we have to go into some colour space. We can't not be in a colour space. Um, if we start with camera colour RGB, this is kind of, I guess, what you mentally think of as the sensor scene, though it has in fact still already been debayered. So this is a debayered image. In other words, it's gone from the sensor to a triplicate of um, uh, files which aren't really being interpreted as sensible pictures. We would need to pull it into a colour space. That could be a, an Adobe colour space, could be the earlier red colour spaces, but obviously I like red colour 2, which is the latest. It still looks dark because all I've done is pick the kind of range of colours that are capable of being um, worked in, a gamut from all available colours to the set that we're on. And this is particularly becoming important in feature film work as the Academy works towards the ACES um, colour science uniform approach across all areas of the industry. Okay, but that's, as I say, linear, which is great if you're a film guy, um, not so good if you're a video person. If you're a video person, you want to automatically look at that in Rec. 709. And to many people's eyes, that's normal. And you know, if, if that's all you want to do, you can set that up as default. It'll all happen like that, and you don't need to worry about anything else. But if you're like me, and you're involved in post-production a lot, you really care about these individual things of color space and, uh, and gamma. And so here I'm going to use the red gamma 2, um, and that would be what I would kind of work in. In fact, that's what most of this was loaded in as. But uh, I wanted to touch on the fact that um, having control on set for this kind of stuff is really, really important. Because, for example, some people would like to see linear. And if we just think about what linear is for a second, if I wanted to sort of take linear and make it look like it was... Uh, video, I would have to apply a curve to it. And that curve here, as you can see, I'm bending it here, is um, giving a kind of normal looking picture. And that curve there, that is the gamma curve that we get as default by picking, say, well, there's a close approximation to it anyway, by picking red gamma 2. So um, that's important. But, but some people are actually going to want log files. Now, if we go to log for a second and use, say, red log, now the picture kind of looks washed out because what we're doing is we may be going out to a, a colour space that's like a Cineon file, which is only 10 bits, uh, and we want to get the most out of our 10 bits. Now, 10 bits is less than the 12-bit linear that the red shot in, um, so we can actually kind of better pack from 12 down to 10 if we use log. So log is a great uh, thing, and so if you're using a Cineon DPX kind of workflow, you might want to do that. Now, of course, if you want to make that look correct, you'll need to go from an inverse log function when you then use it in your particular application. An inverse log function, as you may know, is actually a lot like a, the sort of flip side of a gamma uh, operation. And so that is, in fact, uh, that what I'm just simulating here is the inverse gamma that would happen when you took it into your app. The point is, though, that in that magical stage in the middle of being logarithmic, you've managed to pack 12 bits into 10 much more cleverly. You don't need to worry about that to do general operations, but being able to control your color space and control your gammas uh, are fundamental. Now, I've just done that on an individual clip, but why I'm drawing attention to this in Scratch is because a lot of this stuff happens uh, obviously on a clip basis, no problem whatsoever. You can change uh, any of this stuff that we're, we're seeing here, but also I can handle it in terms of a like a much bigger kind of uh, setup in terms of how I do stuff overall. And you'll see here I've got a media browser. If I click on media browser here, now I actually have uh, the first of sort of the snapshots of the metadata of what's going on with this. Um, so here's the clip that I'm on, and you can see here that we have uh, what's going on with the base of how we brought it in in terms of aspect ratios and stuff. Um, we can also see in terms of what's going on with grades. If we go to R3D files, you can see there's the the information in terms of color spaces and gamma curves, and you'll see there's a red log file that's different as this one from everything else. And so if I wanted to, I could just use my shift key, select all of those, and then change that to be, for example, uh, red gamma 2. And I've now changed everything, and the ones that I changed were highlighted in yellow. 
So you need to be able to manipulate lots of clips quickly and easily and on set, and that's what the lab product is, um, is really good at doing. And the fact that uh, it does that um, lets me just do that to a whole lot of things really, really quickly on the timeline. And now everything is in the right, same consistent space, which is, of course, what a director would want, right? They want the inconsistencies taken out so they know what they're looking at. And you need to be really fast on set so that you can give them what they need and tell them what they're looking at and make it consistent. And you need to have real-time playback. And so this is playing back off a Mac. Um, this is not edited. This is like exactly as it is. It's completely real-time. And it's great because this is what we need. We need to be able to play stuff really, really quickly. Now, the lab product doesn't have uh, some of the features that we have in the traditional Scratch product. And some of those may be important to you. Like on the Mac, um, SDI output is different than it is on the, um, on the Windows box. You need to check all that stuff with Assimilate. But in terms of being able to organize a whole lot of files and really quickly um, manipulate them, this is the kind of stuff that's good, and it's really good in terms of color space. If I switch now, though, from the lab product set, like which is a subset of the master scratch set, and just have a look at scratch sets, I want to keep going with some of these issues. Now, we discussed bit depth there for a second, and one of the things I was saying is that this individual picture, for example, is in the sensor 12-bit, and I might output it as a 10-bit log file. That's a kind of traditional workflow. I say traditional. I mean, you know, in our business, a year is a, a long time. But that Cineon DPX has kind of been the backbone of what we've been doing for, for a few years now. The industry is moving towards open EXR, and it's also moving towards doing high dynamic range. Now, last week, you saw the guys, um, if you were in the webinar, discussing some stuff to do with HDRX. I'm going to discuss that as well and give you a couple of different ways of working than the ways they work, which I think are maybe a bit quicker and easier, but also um, expand on how uh, Scratch is building with the stuff that's happening to go further into what's going on. So let's get back to where we, we were a second ago uh, in Constructs, and here I'm in the webinar. I'm going to bring in an HDR clip, and so I'm going to do that now. Uh, I'm just going to bring in an individual shot, actually. So we have some HDRXs uh, here. And let's see, so uh, I've got loaded in Scratch Media, some files, and I've got some HDRX files. And I've got some, a couple of files here. This is one um, of some friends, uh, a facility, uh, a great place actually in uh, San Francisco. And just take a shot of their office. And I just happened to have shot this uh, when I was there, showing them HDRX. Now again, as I've just loaded this in as an individual clip, the, um, the frame is actually... Uh, going to need to be scaled, so I'll do that. Okay, but this looks kind of pretty normal, right? Like you think, okay, well, that's a shot and it's blown out. This is exactly where you want HDRX because I want what's outside the windows. Now, Scratch, as you, you may or may not have seen, can have those two tracks easily displayable. And uh, that's how uh, the, the red camera is producing them. It's producing them as two tracks. Now, we've been shooting with the Epic um, for a long time, and... Basically, we had one of the early epics, and so this track approach is good. The way that uh, Assimilator is dealing with this is adopting the correct approach with the SDK from RED, and so this is all great. At the moment, though, we don't solve any of the temporal issues. So if this shot was panning and zooming around a lot, we're not solving the offset in time. That is coming, and when that's released into the SDK, I'm sure Assimilator will be one of the first to put it into their product. So... I don't want to oversell HDRX because there are some issues until those additional aspects of what's going on with HDRX come along. But hey, in this case, <laughs> this is exactly what we want to solve the window problem. Okay, so how do I do that? Well, I'm just going to show you our way of doing that really quickly by um, I guess a, like a faster way, I guess, for working when you don't want to have to deal with stuff. And it's also dealing with it in setting up for, as I say, a more of an open EXR pipeline. So the first thing I want to do here is acknowledge the fact that I don't have... Um, you know, like I have this one picture just showing one of the two tracks right now. So what I'm going to do is add a version, and for that version and that version alone, I'm just going to change that track to be one. So what I've basically got is two versions, but one version is showing the track one, one is showing track zero. Obviously, this has got the highlight protection, this hasn't. Now think about what this um, says for a second and what Scratch is doing, because this is really important, that this product is this Scratch product, is able to deal with data beyond the range that the data can be dealt with at capture point. In other words, the red camera has a linear 12-bit file, as we discussed. 
linear. It runs out at some point. It ran out here, and to get this extra exposure detail, it had to do a second picture right after the first one, like an extra super short, super quick, and because it was super short and super quick, it uh, exposed for the highlights, and there you've got it. But in reality, in the real world, light is additive. So if you just think about that for a second, this is correct. This is the extra information that was beyond what could be caught here. So in the real world, we had both this and this. Does that make sense? In other words, the camera couldn't record them both at the same time. It had to take two different shots to do it. But to my eye, to the real world, light is additive. It adds on top of each other. So a really quick way of working with this, and Scratch does this really well, because it is floating point and not limited to 12-bit linear, is just to add these two files together. So if we take this uh, one here that we're on at the moment, and I'm going to just go up and add a... Um, by the way, just before I even do that, I'm going to show you on this histogram what's going on here. Um, that is the, this one here, and you can see it is clipped. There it is run out. Here is that extra information that it is not clipped. And if you could add these two histograms together and adjust for the fact that, you know, obviously just on top of each other, um, you're going to get back what you need. So let me just show you that now in terms of taking that away and just adding a uh, scaffold. So I'm going to create a scaffold, and this is the um, basically the scaffold that is going to have this dark track, and it's going to let me get it built into the other one. So it's texture. I need to just uh, fetch the dark one, and I'm going to take that and put it into there. Now, little tip for you people playing along at home, you need to take this to make sure that it's um, on mapped on canvas and not projected. If it's projected, yeah, it won't kind of work. Okay, so I've done that, and it doesn't look right. It looks like, you know, hey, what's going on? This is just a dark picture. It doesn't seem to be doing anything. And the reason for that is while this is still set over here at the side uh, to be normal, it's just got one picture on top of the other. If I actually change that now to add it, it will literally add both files together. Now, now you'll say, okay, well, now it looks exactly like the, the previous one. Um, and for good reason, because we've inside, inside Scratch done the maths for this in floating point. It's all sitting there properly. But obviously, this picture was, if you like, between 0 and 1, where the white here maxed out at 1. Adding more than over 1 to it is going to make it even more 1, but it still looks clipped. But it isn't, in fact, clipped. And I can prove that by adding yet another scaffold. Now this one, of course, needs to be recursive because I want to deal with both of those layers put together. And now I've added that recursively. Um, what I need to do now is make sure that this is on canvas. And then, uh, if I just go to numerics for a second, this is the one picture now. It's these two combined. They're added, but it doesn't look any different until I start actually adjusting some of the settings. And now you can see that I've actually got exactly what I thought I had, which is to say one individual file that has the highlight detail outside the window and also the interior of their office. And now I can find a better place without having to do any keying, without having to do any mucking around, that is effectively those two uh, images combined. And that is a really good place for a starting point for doing uh, basic work with HDRXs. Now, this emphasizes two things. Firstly, obviously, as you saw with the uh, guys last week from um, their introduction to HDRXs, you can bring back highlights and you can get all creative with keying those together. But for me, what I want is not to actually commit in Scratch to doing that effects work because I've got a bit more of a prepping for VFX mentality. What I want to do is less about seeing Scratch as my final product, as you might have seen in the previous uh, webinar. I want to see it as a tool for prepping into a pipeline. And so I'm prepping into a pipeline. I don't want to be keying right now. I want to be providing downstream all of the information that's required. And so having just done what I've just done, I've basically kind of produce, if I can just bring this down here and show you what we've got. This is the, uh, the new structure um, stuff. You can see here, our picture here, we could have some primaries on it if we wanted to affect it, but we basically got our two A and B um, layers, passes from the camera. We're getting them combined together into the one file. And this one file is now cleverer than what came out of the of the red camera in a sense, because the red camera had to put this as two layers or two separate bits. This is now one bit because Scratch is working at floating point. Don't forget, these individual files down here aren't uh, inherently floating point. They're 12-bit linear. And 
sensibly so because that's what the sensor is producing, we've combined them into one floating point image, which gives me the ability, if I go back out here to the construct, to start thinking about how I can output. Because if I output just like this, obviously I've got a sensible set of settings which you know, is going to output an image. But I can actually add an output to this. Now, if I add an output to this and, um, and start working, I could actually start outputting this as something much more than just um, a straight NTSC or whatever. I can start going and outputting this uh, not as a DPX, but actually as an open EXR. And now I go into 16-bit float because my pipeline upstream of this output is floating point inside Scratch. So Scratch has effectively combined it into a floating point file that can be output with all of the dynamic information. The only thing I need to do is I'd need to take out the gamma that I was applying here because Scratch allows you to deal with either a, a monitor gamma or obviously an actual baked in gamma. And if you remember, I was using red color two gamma. If I'm gonna go open EXR, I'm gonna not wanna have any gamma in there at all which leads to a whole different discussion about um, stuff that we uh, are dealing, I guess, either at FXPHD, this term, which is to do with um, source linear uh, workflows, which is to produce video footage in pretty much the same way that 3D is dealt with, and then being able to deal with that floating point in an open EXR pipeline. But look, this is just one of um, many aspects of why I think Scratch is really um, hardcore. I, I just need to touch on a couple of others really, really quickly before... Um, I go on, which is just to say, like, as I said, I'm dealing about this in a, in a pipeline, and so what worries me are things like this. For example, the, this is the XML uh, relationship to Final Cut, and here you can see I've got, if I just press the S key, I've got notes that are coming up over the top of clips. So if I've got any issues when I'm loading um, XML, layered XML files up, I get, you know, I've, in this case, some plugins that I think are Stu Mashewitches that we used in Final Cut, which aren't obviously translatable to Scratch, and that's warning me about that as I bring it in because I've got up the notes over the top that show me what's going on about that. Um, and this just this is really cool. Not only can you do that. Let's go back to where I was with my uh, where was my uh, down here. Let me just get rid of this for a second, or not get rid of it, but just turn it up. There we go. Here's my webinar. Let's say I wanted to put a note on this. Um, if I actually click on here, I can actually add, a, for example, um, a note. So I could put like a test HDRX open EXR note so that when my, another operator comes along, they can um, see that. I can color code those so that they can be, you know, operational things or flags, you know, warnings. And that's all stuff that can be uh, contained here with what's going on with the files, but also, as I said, you can have stuff individually on the um, individual clips if you want. So there's this idea of working at clip level, there's this idea of working at, at a group level or at a construct level. And uh, I've done entire feature films on Scratch and we set up reels over here and obviously reused a lot of material. But a lot of this stuff, um, like being able to deal with um, other people in the facility, like being able to deal with other bits of kit in the facility and being able to deal with the things that directors need is why I find it um, a really, really useful tool for the kind of stuff that we do. And there is a ton of stuff um, that Red adds on top of that that makes it even more important. Uh, and one of those is metadata. And so it's great to be able to have access to the metadata in Scratch so that we can refer to these kind of things. And as I say, not only the metadata that the camera is generating, but any other apps that are producing files like the RMDs, as, um, as we showed you when we started. Well, look, I hope that's been um, a good overview of how like, uh, we use Scratch in this context of a tool as part of a pipeline. Um, if you've got any questions, um, fire away. Uh, but yeah, I, as I say, it's not just for red footage, but it does really come into its own with red footage. Uh, hello? Hi Mike, we can Hi Mike, we can we can hear you. You guys can hear me? No, that's good. <clears throat> so somebody's just started uh, asking questions, so shall I just start answering them? Okay, so uh, basically uh, there was a question about what kind of horsepower is required for real-time performance with R3D. The great thing about R3D files, um, and this is sort of inherent, I guess, in the way that they are, is that 
you know, <clears throat> an R3D file is a scalable product. It's a, you can access into the R3D at different levels. So this enables you to have real-time performance without, you know, freaking out with incredibly large uh, amounts of kit. So if you've got a machine that's, you know, tricked up, you can obviously run at a higher res and stuff. But the screen that you're working on is nearly always much smaller resolution than the 4K or 5K files. All the stuff I was showing you there, we shot on the Epic, so that was all 5K. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, so basically that was just a, a basic Mac Tower running really happily in real time. Um, so, obviously, once you want to start doing multiple real-time stereo 4K output, you're going to need to have a scratch set up. Uh, maybe with like, you know, dual red rocket cards and stuff, and that's all fine. But it is a scalable kind of idea, and so that makes it uh, pretty easy to work with. I don't, I haven't normally, someone just asked, been running Scratch on my MacBook Pro, simply because I have towers, and also because I tend to do a lot of studio work, um, green screen work, or in location in a way that I'm in a kind of a, a DIT setting where we can actually have a tower. Um, and the other thing about... Um, a MacBook Pro, is if you think about, this has got nothing to do with, with Scratch per se, but it's the bandwidth of the back button until we get uh, the Thunderbolt stuff sorted out. If I start decoding files full resolution, Scratch can handle it, the Red Rocket cards can handle it, the disk drives, however, can't handle it. I haven't got anywhere to put the darn stuff. So I need multiple spindles, which means I need a RAID, which means once I start going there, um, I like having a, a bigger setup and more powerful and kind of um, you know, better to work with. Um, in terms of uh, how does it compare with colour, uh, I think somebody asked, well, that's not a really sensible comparison. I mean, Scratch is a workflow tool, as you've seen, that can do an enormous amount of stuff. Colour is kind of a Mac product that has been integrated into Final Cut, not very pro, and it's just, I don't know, kind of like, uh, you, you know, you look at Scratch as a grading tool, and, and people have done discussions here with Assimilate on that, like webinars. But for me personally, uh, Scratch is just kicking it when it's a, a tool in a pipeline. Like that's the thing that I just find really, really good. Um, and so uh, more than anything else, <coughs> me, more than anything else um, I like to see it uh, running with other boxes. And I wanted to show you how it kind of works well in a facility and, and prep stuff up. So I hope that answers that question. Um, any chance of ProRes output on Windows? We have to ask Simulate about the stuff. I tend to run on Mac. I just like Macs. I've always liked Macs. Um, uh, so there's some stuff here about LUTs. So let me just read this uh, for those of you who don't know what I'm looking at. So I would like to know a little about LUT. Uh, should I pl apply a LUT to work? Uh, it's color spaces. Okay, so... Um, I've got some notes that I can go into if you guys are interested in discussing more about LUTs and color spaces. Uh, it's not obviously hands-on on like what we just saw. It's basically discussing and explaining color spaces and explaining what the hell is going on there because a lot of people don't really understand it. And, <clears throat> and I'm really happy to do that if you want. Or I can just keep asking questions. The thing is I kind of feel like if you really want to have a lot of questions about the configs of a scratch, <clears throat> excuse me, um, if you have the configs of a scratch, you should talk to the Assimilate guys because that's, you know, really like uh, up to the minute with what they do. And I, I don't work for Assimilate, so clearly I don't want to sort of speak on their behalf and get it wrong. But so if you just have a show of hands in the chat, if you everybody's good, and I'm seeing a few yeses already for me discussing color spaces and explaining how that works and, and what's going on, just simply type a yes or a no if you, or raise your hand or whatever, if you think, you know, kind of like want to just discuss this and that button. Okay, I'm not seeing any no's. Uh, okay, I've got Zach saying no, but okay, and Joshua. But apart from that, most people are saying yes. Okay, I'm going to go for the color space uh, discussion. And uh, this doesn't exclude us from doing anything else. It's just um, a figure that might be of interest to some people. And I know a lot of people kind of um, get bugged by this. So uh, let's just go through it. You know, if you find it boring, just put your hands up and say um, stop it and I can... But, you know, I could discuss color spaces all day long. Okay, so <clears throat> LUTs. Okay, so this is the get me to the other side discussion um, about uh, LUTs. Just one second. Okay, so this is the um, get me to the other side problem with LUTs. So what are, what are LUTs and how do they kind of do? 
and and how do they kind of work? The basic level, you've got two kind of LUTs, a 1D and a 3D. And I always think it's funny when somebody starts talking to me about 2D LUTs because it just inherently doesn't um, get it. So basically, a 1D LUT is just saying, like, for any red value, give me another red value. For any green value, give me another green value. For any blue value, give me another one. And literally, it's a lookup table. Like, it's a, like a list of numbers. Like, you look at the file, and you'll actually have, like, you know, a set of numbers down on the left, a set of numbers down the right, and the computer literally goes down with its digital finger and says, oh, you want this number 43, and apparently I meant to turn 43 now into 48. I'll just do that. That's as, it's as stupid as that and as useful as that, right, because it's uh, really good for calibrating stuff and setting stuff up. The thing is, the, the, the lovely thing about a lookup table is that it's fast, but it doesn't take into account any kind of things that happen in the real world where affecting you know, a value that you want creatively actually requires you to do multiple things. In other words, to get some result on an output red, you actually have to adjust the red, the green, and the blue simultaneously. So a 3D light basically says, oh, I've got these sort of three colors. Put it into a magic box, shake it up, and put up another three colors. The key, though, is that, you know, if you're on the lookup table, I look up the red RGB, and I just look up the red, I only affect red. Red only ever affects red. Whereas in the 3D lookup, table world, in the 3D LUT world, it isn't a lookup table, it's a matrix, and so one number affects another. And so now you might say, okay, well, why do I care about this? Well, you don't, except for, um, you need to understand that you tend to have a 1D LUT to calibrate something, and you tend to have a 3D LUT to target something, because they're just cleverer about being able to understand this. And I'm going to get on to color space in a second. Um, this is where it's heading. Okay, the second thing you need to understand about LUTs, which is really important, is this idea that you may view the LUTs. Uh, as viewing LUTs, or you may take the LUT and use it to convert something. Now, that's really important because uh, in the first stage of what I was going through a second ago, we set up the color space and then I was looking at the gamma. Um, I may have a gamma, which is, think of it like a pair of dark sunglasses, that affects how the picture looks, but the picture doesn't get affected. It's just my glasses get affected. In this case, it would be a monitor LUT. Um, and then there's conversion LUTs, and obviously we have real conversion LUTs which convert from one space to another. If you're doing that in floating point, it pretty much is lossless. You could argue mathematically from a sort of Zen point of view that any time you do any operation it involves some pain, but yeah, you can think of it as lossless. And then if you're doing uh, operations mathematically that are 10-bit or 12-bit linear space, it's always going to be lossy. Um, and that's why floating point is such a wonderful thing. Okay, so that's our LUTs. We've got these two types, and we use them in two different ways. <clears throat> okay, let's move on. Second thing is color spaces. Okay, now this is where most people freak out. They're like, what the heck am I looking at? And this makes no sense. And we wanted to look at color, and we have a flat monitor, and we want to somehow graph it. And so it's a sensible thing to look at. And so at school, you used to do the, you know, um, simple things like an RGB sort of circles like we've got on the left there. And if you're a color scientist <coughs> who just basically doesn't ever get out much, you start doing funky things on the right. Okay, so the one we like, or oh, basically there are two of them. The first one is a color cube. Now, a color cube, if you think about it, it's just like uh, for anyone from a 3D background, you know, you've got X on one axis, Y on another, with Z on another. That's R, G, and B. And so obviously if you go all about on all three, you hit white, which would be the corner closest to the screen that you're looking at. And if you took none of them, you'd be back at the origin, which would be black. And so there's a line between black and white that's right through the middle of the screen there. But if I turn the cube around, so I'm looking at the white end, I'm really not, I'm sort of maxing out on luminance, if you like, in every direction. So all I'm looking at is color, if that makes sense. I don't have any shades. I don't have any shades from black to white. I just have the white, right? I don't have any shades in the bottom right corner between green and dark green. I just have green. And so that's a kind of a useful way of thinking about color. And we normally stop there if we're trying to not scare little children at night. But the next thing is to get it more accurate. And then we go to this, which is the chromatic diagram. This is when most people go running for the hills and freak out. Um, and, and I know that we're getting back to scratch, and I understand this, but I just wanted to explain this, and I'm going to take a couple of seconds more, and then I'm going to be back on, on track, I promise. Um, okay, so this is the thing that's freaking people out, and basically it looks weird because it's really useful to, and at the bottom is what I call the purple light, and then there's a spectral locus on the outside. And that is the color space that is the real world. This is general stuff I know, not stretch specific. Okay, and what, what I just want to define here is in the middle there's this great bit um, that is it's effectively our white. Like is it white white or is it a bit reddish white or bluish white? That's color temperature. 
If you go above or below that line, by the way, that's what the hue value is for. So when you're, now I'm back under a red camera. I'm working my way back to scratch, I promise you guys. So, so on, on a red camera, I set up a color uh, temperature, which is actually metadata, and I set up a hue, which is the offset above and below that line, that black line there. And don't ask me to explain in short form why it's a weird shape like that, but just suffice it to say it is. Um, and there are lots of reasons why it is. And at the bottom left corner, it's ultraviolet, and the top or the bottom, sort of right corner, the most ready bit, would go into infrared. Okay, so we have a color space. Color space is just which bunch of colors we work with. So whatever we're in, we're in print, we're in video, whatever, there's going to be a bunch of, not all of them, that are colors we can get to. And so in Scratch, what we need to do is follow this thing that I just said, which is we have to basically debar the file. Scratch does that for us. We don't have to worry about that. That's SDK department. That gets us the white square in the middle here. And then the next thing you want to do is you want to pick the color space you want to go into. Red color space, uh, a Rec 709 color space. But all of this is still just color, right? Um, and then we go out to the black one. And interestingly, noise is introduced when you go from the white to the black, but most people kind of ignore that. But it's noise we can live with, and you can't not do it. And this allows us to have a really sensible set of colors. And that is stage one, and that is color space. And we just need to pick what this triangle is. All color space is, is what are the range of colors that I'm going to work with. But once I've nailed that, and that's my starting point, I need to sort of put that to one side. That's project specific the whole way through. I should just be knowing where I am. The difference between red and almost every other camera is they give you access to the white triangle and you pick the black one. Most every other camera, Sony's, whatever else, are just going to give you the black. They define the color space. Uh, and that's why red seems more complicated, right? Because it gives you more upstream um, advantage on stock. So uh, that's it, basically. Um, and so you've got a color space. You've got a gamma. Uh, the gamma could be not there, like off, which is linear, or on. And it, when it's on, it could be log, or it could be Rex 9 or it could be whatever you like. And you can either bake that in, um, like a JPEG has gamma baked in. You cannot look at a JPEG that doesn't have gamma baked in. Um, or you could say, you know what, I'm going to look at this um, just through some viewing glasses, but keep the file behind it really cool. Now, OK, so. Your monitor, the actual dream color you've got, the thing that's sitting in front of you, that's not going to show you floating point. In the same way, it's not going to show you 4K normally. It's not going to show you 5K. It's not going to show you a bunch of other stuff. So clearly, what we normally try and do is set up uh, some kind of looking light on your monitor so that it looks good and not screw with the underlying file. So from my world, getting back to the whole point of this webinar, in my world, what I really wanted to, to emphasize was that we can take the files and set them up in this super robust open EXR kind of pipe, which is even cleverer than what came out of the RED camera. And then RED uh, has done its job. Simulate has done its job in setting up my file, and then I can just use Scratch on top of that to manipulate the files, look at them, um, uh, check out what's going on, uh, and, and work accordingly. Um, someone's asking about uh, uh, calibrating your monitor. So if I was calibrating my monitor, I would just set my monitor up to be standard across all monitors in the room, right? That's what calibration is about. Um, and once I've got my monitors all calibrated, I then need to target with a LUT where I'm going with it. Now, in my case, if I'm going to feature film, that's a really different kind of print density thing than if I was, say, um, going to go and just go for television. And if you're going out for television, it's kind of easy, right? Because I can just look at it on a television grade one monitor in my suite, and that is what it actually looks like. Um, but if you were, for example, going to go for a feature film, well, I can't look at the feature film densities on a monitor because one of those is reflective light, like it bounces off a screen. The other one is transmissive, like because it's coming off, it's actually, you know, literally illuminating the room, like from a monitor point of view. And so I can just simulate that with a 3D light. Uh, okay, so that's my sort of 10 minute chat on color space. Uh, hopefully that's been um, helpful. Um, so let's get back to some specific questions. And my apologies to whoever said that it was Color Science 101. Um, <laughs> I did ask. Uh, okay, so when do I use uh, Red Log Film and when Red Gamma 2 and Linear? Okay, so uh, so I would honestly say that there's two uses for a log right now. 
um, it's a tremendous useful log if you are going into a 10-bit environment. So for example, if I was prepping files for Final Cut and I wanted to do grading in Final Cut because I was using Final Cut as kind of some kind of finishing thing, um, this is just a, an example. So I'd still throw all my red files under my scratch, I'd process them and I'd come out with a, a log file in 10-bit, 10 10-bit 10 log file. And that would actually have more dynamic range than a 10-bit linear file and then I would take it into uh, Final Cut, and I could actually do grading in Final Cut and, and finish it out. Now, you might say, why don't I just grade it in Scratch? Well, clearly, um, you can do that, but that would be a workflow where you might have an on-set station that's feeding another company, another production, and that production doesn't have a Scratch. And so, clearly, they just want to take the footage and edit it and be done with it, and you're just a DIT, and that's what they ask for, so there you go. Um, the second one, of course, is if you're actually doing film that has a pipeline, like your company has a film pipeline, a Cineon pipeline, 10-bit log pipeline, in which case uh, you'd obviously make sense to go out that way. Uh, does it make sense to go out linear? Very rarely does it make sense to go out linear. And when does it make sense to go out Red Gamma 2? Well, if you like what you're seeing on Red Gamma 2, I think it's a really good way to go. It's a really good colour space to work in. Uh, but if you're going out for television, or like HD, you're probably going to pick that or Rec. 709. The only reason you wouldn't pick Rec. 709 right out of the gate is that the Red Gamma 2 may be what they were looking at on set, and quite often there's an occasion where you go, you know what, I'm going to give them on set what they saw. I'm going to give them post what they saw on set so no one gets upset and freaked out. Okay, I hope that answers that question. Scratch, smoke, GUI look the same along with... I, I don't think the flame and, uh, and uh, smoke and scratch have the same GUI in any way, shape or form, um, mainly because the timeline that we see in um, Scratch those vertical columns are versions, whereas if you had them on uh, Flame in Reels, they're completely different clips that are, you know, completely unrelated. Um, so the timeline construct in Scratch is a unique Scratch thing, uh, and I applaud them for having something unique and, and useful and sensible. Uh, can someone give me a copy of the PPT? It, okay, so if you just want a copy of my PowerPoint, just email me. My guess at fxguide.com. Say that you're in the webinar and I'll send you that. It's only a small file, I can email it. Uh, red's always a mystery. I trust the DRP, the director. Oh, colors, etc. Do I have a scratch on set? Okay, so the thing about scratch is it's really fast. It's not so expensive to have on set and, it's, and it works and it's more than just... Um, like a dumbass station. Like, if you think about Red Cine for a second, like, Red Cine is great, but you speak to the guys at Red, and they're the first to point out it's a free app, right? It's not, you know, designed to be the thing that works with everything else. So it's a, it's a one-trick pony, which is it's a red trick. Now, that's a good trick, but if you're like me, most of the productions end up shooting a bit on 5D. You'll have, like, a GoPro stuck in there somewhere. You'll have a, an ARRI, uh, you have a Red. I mean, you know, like, just a ton of stuff. And so nothing... I mean, I love the red guys. I, those guys are awesome, and I'm really good friends with them. But, I mean, you can't expect them to make a product that supports ARRI RAW or, uh, you know, supports uh, Sony or, or S-Log or anything else. Um, and so, obviously, it's a really good reason for having a workstation on set that is kind of the robust thing. The second thing is if you're the guy that's on set as the DIT, it's a good position or it's a shitty position. If it's a, it's a good position if you're the guy that's the go-to guy that can just show the director what they need, immediately bring up something, it's just there, bang, bang, wow, thanks, man, I, I'm done, and walk, he walks away. It's a shitty position if he walks up and says, can you show me that? Uh, yeah, I just have to render that. Uh, yeah, no, that, that's, um, mm, yeah, it's kind of a bit harder to do in this box. And so... What I like about Scratch on set is that you just go, look, here are the three versions. You sort of set that up. The director walks over. You go, bang, bang, bang. They go, great, thanks. That's what I need. Can you play that in real time? Yep, great. Can I see that with that other shot in front of it? Yep, great. Okay, good. And then they walk away again. And you're like, phew. You know, my, my, I've sat here for three hours and no one's spoken to me. And suddenly it was all on and I delivered. And at the same time, you can be prepping data, knowing that the box is reliable, knowing that it's doing all the right things. So, yeah, I think uh, Scratch has a great place on set. I may personally slightly differ from Assimilate as to the exact feature set that I use on set, which means I tend to want to have Scratch a bit more than just Lab uh, because I do a lot of HDR and a lot of HDR prep, and I tend to prefer Scratch than Lab over that. Uh, but, yeah, like Lab's a great product, and, I mean, I, you know, I have Scratch, so why wouldn't I use it? 
um, uh, CML stuff. Yes, there's CML stuff in there, and CM the CDL stuff. Uh, the CDL stuff is the precursor. I don't think CDLs are very useful. Like color decision lists are not incredibly useful right now. But it's that whole movement to trying to standardize is a precursor to the ACES stuff that I alluded to in the presentation. And when ACES hits properly, that'll be just awesome. Um, workflows for compositors and you can after effects. Well, obviously, the great thing about workflow for out of scratch is you can do OpenXR, right, which means you can do C and linear, which means that you can, if you get your crap together, produce um, an incredibly robust pipe. And the cutting edge of robust pipes right now is C linear um, scene reference workflow with open EXRs and, and going above um, stuff that you would get out of a city on file. So, yeah, that's awesome. Um, outputting multiple formats. Yeah, I only showed you one output, but you can easily output multiple formats, and that's a really good thing. And that's the same thing I was talking about with directors. You know, you just have to be able to do multiple stuff and, and punch them out really, really quick and stuff. Um, can I export EDL, XML, relink, TPXs? I think what you're asking is, can I work with the XML out of Final Cut and stuff? And absolutely you can, and we did that. In fact, I, I alluded to that when I flashed it up there. Of course, the new Final Cut Pro is useless in this respect, but then I consider the new Final Cut Pro to be Final Cut Express and not Final Cut Pro. So, but yeah. Um, and you know, I use Scratch in post as the kind of base station. Like, I know the guys at uh, DD back in the day, I remember when I first got it, they were using it as, like, the thing that controlled the projector. And uh, I was on set of, uh, what was it, um, Journey to the Centre of the Earth, the first one in stereo, and that, they did the same thing. Like, it was like, you want to control the projector, it's really, really easy to swap in versions and stuff. So every time I did director reviews, I was using Scratch, and I just like it as a base station I can put stuff into and it can access stuff, because it's not so expensive that you're tying up a you know, million dollar suite for a, the, the production for a really long time. So I think it's really good. Um, is it an alternative to smoke? Well, no, smoke has a lot more effects stuff. I mean, let's not beat around the bush here, right? You can't do the compositing stuff that you can do in, um, in a flame or in a uh, smoke in a scratch. But then by the same token, you don't have the same kind of uh, flexibility that you get because those products are very much finishing products. Um, so, you know, uh, Red Cine X, a runner, bring me CF cards from Red, good scratch, let me. Yeah, absolutely, you can do different looks. Uh, there, this whole idea of versioning and different looks is absolutely what Scratch is just started out being really, really good at. Um, and you're right, yeah, if you, it does fit very well into an early, so this is uh, Dominic, it does fit very well into an early production because it's fast on set and stuff, and it also lets you conform and take stuff through. Now, that means that for some people, Scratch appears as the workhorse that does everything and lets them have the one box from on set right through to post. And so if you were just to simulate, you'd say, of course, you don't need any other pool anywhere else in the world. And I, I respect that. But And it's true that I know that there are some small productions that do exactly that. What I wanted to emphasize, though, is Scratch the other way around, where Scratch knows and works well with Final Cut, Flame, uh, 3D pipelines that are OpenEXR and fits really, really well in with lots of other tools. So um, my perspective is that I, you know, I'm no claim to be doing everything in the world. I'm just big on workflow, and so uh, so that's great. Uh, man, sorry, uh, somebody has a question. They say it's stupid, but no, it's not. Um, what is the best approach on Dream Color? Uh, Okay, so you're asking what's the best approach to a LUT on your dream color monitor? Um, is that what you're asking? I think that's what you're asking. Okay, uh, well, okay. So uh, it's a slightly, this is not really a scratch related question, but you, you want to set up your monitor to be calibrated first and foremost, right? So it needs to be calibrated so that you know where you are relative to everybody else. And then it depends on what you're trying to do. Are you trying to do feature film work? Are you trying to do uh, TVC work? I mean, obviously from a personal point of view, if you're doing TBC work, I think you should calibrate your dream color to Rec. 7 and 9. But dream colors are really good monitors. So depending on what you're doing, you can set them up. Yeah, so if you're doing, H if you're doing uh, HD work, then calibrate your dream color to Rec. 7 and 9. Rec. 6.01, by the way, is, is the sort of NTSC PAL level. 
Rec 709 is the HD level. And if you're wondering what the numbers mean, they mean nothing. They're just that they came up to recommendation 709 right after they did recommendation 708. So they just call it Rec 709. It sounds like it's cleverer than it is. Um, some of the other ones that you've got on your drink color are set up for print. So it's less relevant. Um, you want to try and get yourself calibrated to everything else in the pipe. So if everybody else in the pipe is looking on Rec 709 monitors, you want your stuff on Rec 709 so that it looks the same. So no one says, hey, this looks different. Okay, so that hopefully has answered Rodney's uh, question. Um, which foundry would turn Storm into a nonlinear editor? Well, I'm sure a lot of people think that after Final Cut. Uh, okay, so Nuke and Scratch seems to be coming up. Okay, so the bottom line is that um, uh, Storm is a really good product, and I'm not here to tell you that... Uh, you shouldn't use Storm or you shouldn't use Red Cine X or, or whatever else. Um, I'm just telling you personally for me, there are uses for things uh, and in a workflow environment that I'm pushing today, Storm doesn't handle stuff beyond Red, right? It's like Red Cine X. It, it is in the same category. So it's not that it sucks. It's just that, you know, I'm talking about the fact that this is a product that existed before Red. I mean, people don't think of it that way, but I can tell you that I was using it really happily before we even knew what a red camera was. Uh, and they just happened to be at the forefront of doing cool stuff. So when red came along, they hooked up with red and they were one of the first to support red. So this is a company that just is not come out of, you know, the last 10 minutes. And so as a consequence, it really works well with a huge variety of stuff. But the other thing is, think about it from a Simulates point of view, right? Like if they didn't work well with others, no one would buy the bugger because like, you know, they're not a company like Autodesk that can dictate an entire pipeline from 3D to, you know, projection. Um, so both from the company's point of view, it's like in their vested interest, and secondly, historically, because they work that way, and thirdly, just in reality, using it, it works well with others, and that's a really big deal. Uh, okay, what's next? I think I need to stop talking now. Um, so if everyone else wants to jump in from Assimilate or whatever, that's fine. Um, I think I'm running out of time. My clock has two minutes left on the board. I'm sure I've talked much longer than I should have anyway. Uh, if you've got any questions, just shoot them to me at uh, FX Guide or, you know what, um, feel free to just uh, jump over to FX PhD where we basically do this stuff full time. Uh, so thanks so much for being with us. And thanks, guys, for being asking um, questions. And I hope I um, balance stuff out for you. And thank you, Assimilate, for letting me be here. Thank you for joining us today. See this presentation on demand within 24 hours at www.assimilateinc.com and watch for more Assimilate webinars coming your way soon. Thank you for joining us today. See this presentation on demand within 24 hours at www.assimilateinc.com and watch for more Assimilate webinars coming your way soon.